really excited to share um, this passage with you today, and uh, I, w- I want to say there, it, what we're going to look at here this morning is uh, a lot, a lot to take in. There's a lot of questions that you might have coming off of this um, passage of Scripture, and I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to touch on everything today, but I do want to, in some ways, whet your appetite. Uh, to help you dive into this because all too often when we look at different rituals or practices in the church, we just kind of go through the motions, right? And so I want us to look fresh and new at the Lord's Supper today. I want us to see the gospel, to hear the message of the truth of what Jesus has done for us. So I want to quickly, uh, I want to draw your attention to Mark chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 12 to 31. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to, to 31 this morning. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 31. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, His disciples, that's Jesus' disciples, said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city. And they found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came in, that's Jesus, came in with the twelve into Jerusalem. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes it is, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he, man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, and he said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. This is God's word for us this evening. Let's pray as we begin um, together. Lord, we come to you today. We acknowledge our need for a Savior. Oh, Father, would you speak words of truth today? I pray, God, that my, my words would be concise and clear, and God, that they would fall not on deaf ears, but on the soil of people's hearts. And God, that it may bear fruit that it may grow. And Lord, I pray, Jesus, that it wouldn't be me speaking, God. I pray that it would be you. I ask God, just even in my own heart, to know, God, do not be anxious because the Lord is near. And I thank you, God, for your word. I I thank thank you, God, for what you are doing in our church. May we draw us to you. May we look to our Savior today. And may we be filled with worship in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. So again, we're looking through the book of Mark, and you you keep hearing me say it over and over again because I'm trying to drive this home, that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what Mark is trying to present to us. Jesus is the Son of God who has come as a servant and a savior to sinful people. A, A servant and savior to sinful people. And last week, Pastor Dan was preaching. He started off uh, Mark chapter 14, and um, he, was, he gave us two very different accounts of, of people who saw something in Jesus. He gave us the account of Mary and what she saw in Jesus. Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with this expensive perfume. See, Mary, what she saw in Jesus was this Lord worthy of extravagant worship. And then we read right afterwards where it, Judas plans to betray Jesus. See, for Judas, all he saw in Jesus was a man worth about 30 pieces of silver. Today, I want us to get a picture of what Jesus saw, to get a picture of what he's seeing as he's approaching his death, the most crucial moment in, I would say, all of history that ever has been, that ever will be, the most important moment through the eyes of the one who would die for us. And specifically today, we're going to look at the Lord's Supper, or communion, or the Eucharist. It's, it's gone by many different names. But I want us to really dive in today to see what this supper, this what they call Last Supper, and I would actually say it's probably the first supper of many suppers that the church is going to have in remembrance of what he's done This Lord's Supper, this communion is a picture. It's a picture of what Jesus has accomplished by his death on the cross. It's not the meal itself that saves us. It's a picture of what Jesus' death has accomplished for us on the cross. Now, we are in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And and if you're reading the passages you know, you kind of wonder, uh, if you're, as you're reading Mark, how did we get to this point? Because it was less than a week ago, less than a week ago, that Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, and it was a party. Like, he rode in on a donkey, and they were waving palm branches, and they were celebrating, singing, Hosanna, and here it was on a Thursday, after that Sunday, and his death is drawing so near, so near near. See, on Sunday, Jesus was celebrated publicly as a king coming into Jerusalem. We see that in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. And then right after that, he goes into the temple, he upsets the tables and the people, and he prophesies against it, ticks off the religious leaders, and then comes out of Jerusalem to Bethany, where we arrived last week, where his his feet were anointed by Mary outside of Jerusalem. And now in today's passage, Jesus re-enters Jerusalem. I want to, in some ways, hold the two passages of Jesus entering into um, Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, and then our passage today, in Jesus re-entering Jerusalem this close to his death, I want us to see something very significant. I don't think it's by accident the way Mark put everything together, because if you'll notice, in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 10, and in, in Mark chapter 14, verses 13 all the way to 15, Jesus uses some very familiar language. He lays it all out in in a very similar way. You'll remember when when Jesus is coming triumphantly in Mark 11 into Jerusalem, he says, guys, okay, two of you go into the city, you're going to see a donkey there with her colt tied to her, and you're to go to the master and say, "The, the Lord is in need, and then you're to bring that colt out to me. He gives them clear step by step instructions of what they're supposed to do. And today, he does the exact same thing in preparation for Passover. He, he, he says, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where's my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And on and on, he gives instructions that are laid out very similarly. But also, notice something about the differences. Mark is trying to get our attention on something. In one case, 
He enters the city triumphantly like this Messiah king. It's a reference back to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. But what about this passage we're looking at today? In one case, Jesus enters the city publicly in daylight as a celebrated king-like figure on a donkey. And in the other... In our passage today, he enters the city under the secrecy of night and under the threats of death. And I would dare say that he's entering into Jerusalem a second time, this time as a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, as the suffering servant, the one who will enter into the city, who will give his life for many. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. See the differences in just less than a week? And yet, the Bible has already foreordained, forespoken about this man who would give himself up for many. So you, you gotta, it begs the question, why on earth, if Jesus knew he was the suffering servant, if he was this guy who was gonna give himself up for us, die a horrible death, if he knew it was coming near, why on earth we enter into Jerusalem? Well, the answer from our passage today is that he's entering into Jerusalem to have a meal. Have a meal. Now, what is it that's so important about this meal? All of this for a meal. Put yourself in harm's way so you can eat some bread, some meat, drink a little wine. Why on earth would you do that, Jesus? Well, I want to explain the significance of the Lord's meal in three parts, just very quickly. First of all, this meal shows us who we are. Secondly, this meal shows us what we need. And then thirdly, I want to drive it home and help you understand how this meal can change your life. How, this meal shows us, firstly, who we are, shows us what we need, and how this meal can change your life. First of all, this meal shows us who we are. Jesus was preparing to celebrate the Passover meal, which was a long-celebrated meal. It was, at the, it was every Jewish New Year. They would hold the Passover with every New Year. And they were celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. The religious leaders, Judas and the Herodians and soon the Romans are pressing in on Jesus. Things are getting really dangerous for him. And what does he do? He sits down to eat. Now, okay, um, I, don't, I have Netflix in my home. And uh, I, occasionally we try and find some things that we can watch as a family and, and over the last little while we've been watching Planet Earth. How many of you have seen Planet Earth and know what that, that is? You know, from BBC, British Broadcasting Company. Um, it's <clears throat> Planet Earth is just this nature series. I know we're that type of family. Uh, like, just a nature series about watching all sorts of animals in their natural habitat, and, and it's just, it's beautiful, right? You get to see all different places of the world, and you get to see everything from the Arctic to the desert to, you know, just the rainforest, and you get to see all the, the um, different types of plant, plants and, and animals that are there. One thing I've noticed, and, and it's very non-invasive, I don't know if you've watched the show before, but they're, they're just there to video, and just video life, one thing I've noticed is, is a common theme in our world is the battle between predator and prey. The battle between predator and prey. You can go to most places in the world and you'll see this battle going on. You'll see someone who, or you'll see something, I should say, an animal rather who is hungry and he's chasing after some other animal. It might be wolves against bison or a lion against some kind of uh, gazelle or a crocodile versus the wildebeest. And you'll notice that, that at some point as you're watching this whole scene play out, you know, the predator sneaks in very, very carefully, very sneakily, if that's even a word, sneaky-like, I should say, sneaky-like, 
I'm referring to my Islander language. Okay, uh, sneaky-like, and, and you'll see all of a sudden the prey, they don't really seem to figure out what's going on, but eventually they stop. They freeze. And then everything just erupts, and they run for it, right? They're just gone out of there. They're, they're, they're running. It's causes a stampede, and there's, there's predators coming in from all over, and they're, they're going after them. very different than what we see in our passage today. Now put yourself in this scenario. People are coming after you. Maybe you've felt like that before. What do you do in that moment? What do you do when you sense danger around you? Um, one of my favorite sci-fi movies, Minority Report, um, with Tom Cruise. It's probably my favorite, one of my favorite Tom Cruise movies, if I can be so bold to say that, uh, <coughs> um, is, is there's, there's, a, there's a part in that movie where it's, it's a very futuristic movie. He plays a cop, and they, they have a, a way of figuring out people uh, are going to commit crimes before they actually commit them. Um, it, it's really weird, I know. Uh, I'm kind of geeky like that. But, but like it, it, there's a part in that movie where he's on the run for this crime that he was yet to commit, and the, the uh, police are coming after him, and he's a policeman himself, so he knows all these cops who are chasing him. And there's this part where one of his friends comes up to him, and, he's, and he's, you know, they have him surrounded. They're all pressing in on him, and they say to him, his, his friend's name is Fletch. He, Fletch says to John Anderton, that's Tom Cruise's person, he, he says, he says, John, don't, don't run. Don't run. And Anderton turns to him and says, well, you don't have to chase me. And then Fletch says, well, you don't have to run. And then Tom Cruise gives that, you know, Tom Cruise look, you know, the very sneer look, and he says, everybody runs. Everybody runs. That's actually one of the like, top 100 quotes of movies, just in case you're wondering. So a little bit of movie trivia there for you. Uh, you can enter into my geekdom for a bit. Um, <clears throat> but, but this is a very true reality for a lot of us. When the going gets tough, when it looks like danger is all around us, we run. We run. Some of us try to be bold and we say, I'm going to stand firm. But even that, even that, okay, I can even give you that. Even if you want to stand firm in the midst of all that struggle, you, I don't, I don't think it holds a candle to what we see Jesus doing in this passage, to what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels here. You'll notice in chapter 14 of Mark, there's this theme that's woven throughout the entire, this entire chapter. There's a pattern there. I don't know if you've noticed it. It's, it's one bad thing followed by one good thing. Bad thing, good thing, bad thing, good thing. Like, just even look at the first half of it with me. There's a plot to kill Jesus in verse, chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. And then <clears throat> the scene shifts to Bethany, where Jesus is being anointed. And that's a good thing. He's saying, it's going to, hey, guess what? She's anointing me for my burial. And then, and then, right after that, it shifts back to a bad thing. Judas is plotting, planning. To, to hand Jesus over. And then it switches to a good thing. Jesus is preparing for the Passover. And then back to a bad thing. Jesus is like, one of you is going to betray me. And then after that, it switches to a good thing. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And then back to a bad thing again. Jesus says, hey guys, all of you are going to betray me. Want to know what's amazing about that pattern? Jesus doesn't run. He doesn't run. He sees all of these things happening around him, and guess what he does? He doesn't even stand firm. He presses in further. He presses in further. Guys, this is our Savior. This is our God, the one who does not run. When, tr when, tr when tr trouble, trouble comes around him, he presses in further. Why is he doing this? Well, I believe Jesus is going all the way in to pull us all the way out. 
He is doing something that we cannot. He's showing us something by his actions. I mean, look at Judas and the disciples in verses 17 to 21. When it was evening, he came in with the 12, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, notice about this passage. Jesus is God in the flesh, right? He knows who it is. But yet he's, he's completely ambiguous. Completely ambiguous. He's not specific at all. He's not like, hey guys, by the way, it's Judas. Judas is the one to betray me. You know, he's not at all pointing at him. He says, one of you will betray me. And look at the reaction of the disciples. Look at what they do, verse 19. They began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, is it I? I think Jesus is trying to drive something home to them. Jesus wanted each one of his disciples to look inward and see something. He wanted them to look deep within their hearts, examine their hearts, and see, and see that the possibility of them being the betrayer is in all of them. It's in all of them. It's a very crucial picture. Jesus wanted them to see that when it came down to the threat of his judgment or death, everybody runs. Now, there's, again, there's an interesting point as we come to the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper here. It's sandwiched by two very important things. See, most of us look at, at the outside forces. We look at the Romans and the Jews and the, the uh, religious leaders and we say, oh, they killed Jesus or, you know, they, they totally rejected Jesus and went after him. But in this passage, Mark makes it very clear. It is focused not on the Romans or the religious leaders, but it is focused on those people who think they're Jesus' friends. Judas, Peter, these guys who were so close to Jesus, these guys who had followed Jesus for the past three years, and Jesus says to, you, to them, guys, it's in you. That darkness, that fear, that running, that sin, just because you've been with me for the past three years doesn't make you any more special or any more able to take on what I'm about to take on. How often we get like that? How often do so many of us say, well, I go to church every day. I'm Jesus' friend. I'm close to him. I read my Bible every day. I do the things. God is lucky to have me. But here's the reality, friends, you can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. See, even those closest to Jesus will abandon him, as we read in verses 26 to 31. This is a picture, friends, of sin. Sin is separation from God and from each other. Isaiah 53, 6, again, coming back to that, says, all we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've wandered off to our own, on our own. And then Romans 3, 10 to 12, says this, there is none righteous, no, not one. Not one. Not one. One. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now there's a pick me up verse. But there's a reality in it. There's a reality in it. it friends, it shows us who we are. Who we are. No one seeks after God. In fact, we're, we're going the opposite way, right? We're running. We're running. And this is, this is the nature of sin. Sin is both horizontal and vertical. Not only does it, is, does it, 
does it separate us from God and each other? It, it affects everyone and everything and kills everyone and everything. Sin is universal. There is none walking on this earth today who is without sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have. And not only that, sin, sin completely separates us from God. We deserve complete judgment. So friends, we cannot save ourselves. So what do we do? What do we do that puts us in a place of panic, doesn't it? Your good deeds, even your good deeds are not enough to save you. Even your good deeds condemn you. We can't get ourselves out of this. The predators are coming after us and they will tear us to pieces. We are sinful people in great need. Secondly, this meal will show us what we need. Sin makes us slaves to things that are not meant to have power over us, right? Like, I love my family, I love my wife, I love my children, but they make horrible gods, okay? They make horrible gods. Sin makes us slaves to things that are not meant to have power over us. Jesus, in coming into Jerusalem, is celebrating the Passover meal. And the Passover meal originates all the way from the book of Exodus. And, and if you look back to Exodus 11 and 12, you'll read the story of the Passover. You'll remember that um, the Israelites, God's chosen, chosen people, these are Abraham's descendants, whom God has created a, a, a God has created people from, and they would eventually, you know, the Jewish uh, nation. At this point in time in history, back in Exodus 11 and 12, they were enslaved by the Egyptian pharaoh. They were under his rule, and he was a tyrant. The people were completely enslaved. They, were, they had to make bricks, and they were getting very little. Many of them were dying off. They were under just this tyrannic rule of the Egyptian pharaoh. And God sends Moses, you'll remember, to speak on God's behalf and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Set my people free. And, Mer- and Pharaoh, of course, his heart is, heart is hardened. And he says, no, I will not do that. And God sends on the Egyptians um, uh, a series of plagues. A series of plagues. Now, if you look deeply into it, what's kind of neat is just each one of those plagues represents a different Egyptian god that God is really insulting. It's kind of a a neat study to jump into, but we're not going to go there today. But it comes up to this last plague. This last plague. And up until then, Pharaoh has not, has refused to let the children of Israel go. And this last plague, God says in chapter 11 and 12 that he will go out among the land and he will kill the firstborn of every home. He will kill the firstborn of every home. Now, notice something about this passage, friends. Notice something about it. God's judgment doesn't just fall on the Egyptians. God's judgment falls on everyone in that place. God's judgment falls on the Israelites, his chosen people as well. His chosen people. God will kill the firstborn of every household, but God says this to each and every person in that land. What he says is this, If you take a lamb, a pure, spotless lamb, and you kill it, and you take its blood, and you put it on the doorposts of your home, when I see that blood on your doorposts, I will pass over your home. See, this was for the Israelites too. See, God also went among the Israelites. Judgment and justice fell on everyone, but you will survive only if you kill a lamb and take shelter under its blood. 
And what they would do is they would take this lamb, they would kill it, they would put the blood over its doorposts, and then they would eat the lamb along with bitter herbs and unleavened bread and, and, and certain types of wine and, and stewed fruit, and they would celebrate this Passover meal as God would pass over the land. Look at verse, verses 12 and 13 of Exodus 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See, in every home that night, in every home, there was either a dead lamb or a dead child. The only way you can survive is if a substitute died in your place. We call this substitutionary atonement where we do not get what we deserve because something else has taken our place. Something else has taken our penalty, our, what we deserve. And so God goes out that night and he passes over the land and following the Passover, the Israelites are set free from bondage the Passover meal instituted a new year, a new people, a new ruler, a new home, and a new tradition for the people of Israel. Every year, a Jewish family from that time onward all the way up to where Jesus, at the point where Jesus is, is taking the Passover lamb in Jerusalem with his disciples, every year a Jewish family would get together, sacrifice a lamb, and ceremonially celebrate their liberation from slavery. And they would eat the same meal that was eaten that Passover evening and they would retell the story of the Passover and praise God for their deliverance. So we read in, in Mark chapter 14 verses 22 to 25 about how Jesus and his disciples get together to celebrate the Passover meal and every time they would celebrate the Passover there was a ritual, there was almost like a liturgy, there was an order of things. They had four cups of wine that they would share among all of us and they'd be brought out at different times and the bread would be brought out at different times and the lamb would be brought out at different times and with each stage they would have different things that they would say. They would recite um, what's called the Hallel Psalms. That's um, the Psalms 113 to 118. They would sing some of those psalms throughout the evening together. It was all very orderly. And there was someone who would stand and preside or orchestrate the whole thing. So we read of Jesus orchestrating this meal with his disciples. And they bring in the food, they, they say the blessings, they sing the psalms, on and on. And then it comes to the time where Jesus is blessing the unleavened bread. This is before the meal. This is before the lamb is brought out. And Jesus blesses the unleavened bread. Now the tradition is that they would hold up this bread, this unleavened bread, and they would say, this is the bread of our affliction, which our fathers ate in the wilderness. But we notice Jesus does something very different. He strays a bit from the beaten path, from the tradition. He says this in verse 22, take, this is my body. seemed probably pretty odd for the disciples. It's like, okay, Jesus, you're kind of off script here. And I think you're supposed to say, you know, this is the bread of our affliction, which our fathers ate in the wilderness. But Jesus does something different. And then, when the third cup of wine is brought out, the third cup of wine where they would praise God for bringing them out, for bringing them out from, from Egypt, bringing them to the promised land, being his people, Jesus 
again, strays from the tradition. We read in verse 24, he says, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Now to help us understand that a bit, why Jesus did this, I want you to notice something. The Passover meal, the last, or the Lord's Supper is mentioned in every one of the Gospels. But do you know what's not mentioned in those passages? The main course. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, anytime they refer to the Lord's Supper, we have no indication that they brought out the lamb and they ate the lamb. I think Mark and Matthew and John and Luke were on to something here. I think they were trying to draw us, our attention to the greater lamb, the greater sacrifice. See, friends, the lamb, the Passover lamb was not on the table because the Passover lamb was at the table. He was at the table. So when Jesus holds up the bread and he says, and says, and says, take, this is my body broken for you. He's saying, this is the bread of my affliction. This is the bread of my affliction for you. This cup is my blood for you. This blood of mine will be poured out for your salvation. See, Jesus is showing his disciples and us that the Passover meal was not just a reference to a specific event. Rather, it was a foreshadowing, a picture of the greatest event that was to come. His death on the cross. Don't you see? Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is what we need. He is that perfect, blameless, spotless lamb who has become our substitute. Who has stepped into our place. Because friends, while it seems like a crazy story to read of the Passover and of Pharaoh's enslavement of the children of Israel, I gotta say this here today, there is a greater enslavement than Egyptians. There is a greater judgment than just losing our firstborn child. And friends, the good news is that there is a greater sacrifice that will set you free from that judgment. Every slaughtered lamb pointed to the Lamb of God. Isaiah says in chapter 53, 6, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. See, Jesus is what we need. Your greatest need is fulfilled in Jesus' death on the cross. So so let's let's go here. How does this meal change you? What's, What's the big deal? There's something significant, obviously, about it, but how does this meal change us? Well, at this last supper before his death, and by no accident, I don't think that, that it happened to be Passover. I think Jesus obviously planned it that way. Jesus instituted something new that is still kept to this very day, and we're going to have it in just a little while. The Lord's Supper or communion that we are going to partake together, that we are going to eat together as believers, as followers of Jesus. But here's the thing, friends. It's not a magical meal, okay? Eating this, this, these crackers and this Welch's grape juice or maybe even no-name brand grape juice that we have for you today doesn't save you. You'll notice Jesus himself didn't in any way believe that this Passover meal, this Lord's Supper saved them because he still went out from there and died. He wasn't just like, okay, guys, you got the meal, you're good, okay, awesome, let's, uh, let's go out. I'm going to leave, I'm going back to heaven. No, he left from there to a gruesome, painful death. And, and friends, contrary to what you may, you may think or believe, we do not actually eat the body of Jesus and drink his blood. Okay, this does not become the blood of Christ. This does not become the body of Christ. It's a picture. Like, I can have a picture of my wife and think, wow, that's a great picture, but that picture doesn't talk back to me. That picture I can't really have a relationship with unless we're apart, right, and 
you know, I'm kissing it or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but it's not going to talk back to me. It's, it's only just a symbol of the person that I know, of the person I get to spend every day of my life with. And in the same way, this meal is a picture of the one who has given himself for you. This meal is not what saves you. It is a picture of the one who can and has saved you. Jesus explained the significance of his death at a meal and he wants his death to be remembered by a meal. Now in the church, we call this a sacrament. That's a very churchy word, but I'm gonna explain it. A sacrament is a visible symbol of an invisible spiritual reality. It's just like baptism, right? Baptism, we, we baptize them in water, and we bring them up out of the water to signify they're dead to sin and they're alive in Christ, right? It's, it's baptism itself, this water, we don't bless it or make it holy water or whatever it is. It's just water. It's a visible symbol of an invisible spiritual reality. It's God who saves God alone. See, and, and, and here's, here's where I'll, I'm going to drive it home with you. A meal does you no good unless you take it in. A meal does you no good unless you take it in. Look at verse 23. Jesus, it says, after the, as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and he said, take, take, Now, I'm speaking symbolically, of course, but I want you to see this. I want you to see that in the same way we take in food, we can't just sit at a table and expect, oh, I'm nourished. You have to eat it. But in the same way that you see, uh, in in the same way that we take in food, we also, by faith, take in the sacrifice of Jesus into our lives. By faith and faith alone, And when you take it in, friends, it changes you. So that's why we keep celebrating it. That's why we keep having the Lord's Supper each and every Sunday here at Centerpoint. I'm so glad we do because we gotta keep working it in and working it in and working it in that every time we come to this table, it doesn't just become, well, I'm just gonna go through the motions, but wow, wow. His body was broken for me. His blood was shed for me. And because of what he has done for me, I am set free from the bondage of sin. So how do we do this? So what should we look for? I just want to quickly jump to three things. Three things, what this meal signifies to us. First of all, this meal signifies to you your dependence on Christ. Your dependency on Christ. You are no longer dependent upon yourself, but Christ and Christ alone. Look at what Jesus says in verses 24 to 25. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now what is Jesus doing there? Do you notice his words? He's making a promise. He's taking an oath. He's taking an oath. Now, in in biblical times, oaths were a big deal. They were a big deal. Like even, they would take, people would take oaths and, and, and they would take serious oaths, right? It wasn't just like, I promise. You know, it was, it was like they were willing to like rip animals in half, you know, and blood all over the place and guts everywhere and they'd walk between and say, hey, you know what, if, uh, if, you know, if I go back on my uh, commitment, then you know what, let what has happened to this animal happen to me. Pretty serious. And, and there was actually to people willing to say, like to go to their death on an oath, like there, it, later on in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we read about these people who hated Paul so much and they said, I will not eat another ounce of food. I will not drink anything more until Paul is dead. You know what they're saying there? I will, I, I, I will keep my oath even if it kills me. Do you see what Jesus has done for you? Do you see the, the, 
the oath that Jesus is committing himself to you? This is, this is the difference between a contract and, and what we call covenant, okay? And, and I, I want to very, because the two are so often confused. A contract, it says, it's like an employer saying to an employee, this is what I expect of you. If you want to work here, this is what I expect of you. You've got to do this. That's what a contract is. A covenant is the other way around, where the employer says to the employee, this is what you can expect of me. This is what you can expect of me. That's why, if I can go off on a tangent for a while, marriage is not a contract. It's a covenant. It's not about, you better fulfill these needs of mine, or else we're done. No, it's rather, this is what you can expect of me. I promise myself to you. It's not on the other person, it's on you. And what we see in the Bible, which is so beautifully portrayed, is that God himself covenants with us, not saying, this is what I expect of you, because really that's legalism, isn't it? That's legalism. If you, if you gotta be good, you gotta do all the right things, and that way you, you can get into heaven, you can have a relationship with me. No, covenant is God saying, this is what you can expect of me. I am enough. My death is enough for you. Now, Jesus is wholly committing himself to us when he says, this is my blood of the covenant. Now look in verse 31. And verse, also in verse 29, we read here of someone else who tries to take an oath, right? Peter. Peter says to, to Jesus, even though they all fall away, I will not. And then again, verse 31 he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. See, Peter's trying to take an oath, and Jesus is like, Peter, no, you won't. No, you won't. Because when it comes down to it, you're going to run. You're going to run. You can't take that oath. See, friends, this is what Jesus is saying to us through the Lord's Supper. Your salvation does not depend on your commitment to me, but rather my commitment to you. My commitment to you. The Lord's Supper or communion reinforces this in your life. My relationship with God does not depend on my record, but Christ's record. It's not based on my past, but Christ's past. It's not based on my righteousness, but his righteousness. Don't you see, when you are dependent on Jesus, that is a great thing we're celebrating. Because it does not rely on you, it relies ultimately, totally on him. And that changes you. That changes you. You're no longer going out there trying to figure out, man, I better do the right thing. Man, I better do this to make God like me more or make other people like me more. No, God likes you enough. He loves you enough. His commitment to you is, is one you would never give up. And then, just very quickly, two other things. Your, what this meal signifies to you is your community in Christ. Your community in Christ. Notice what the Passover meal in those days was, was meant to be eaten with a family, right? The family would gather around and they would go through the ritual of having a Passover meal together. But look what Jesus does. Jesus calls the disciples out of their families and he makes a new family. He makes a new family. So just in the same way as Jesus is calling them together to be family, these 12 guys who would run away from Jesus, Jesus would come back for, restore them, and they would become one of the most powerful forces on this earth in, in instituting the church, which is still being celebrated to this day. And this is why we gather together as the family of God. You sit beside brothers and sisters in Christ, and we get to remember his death together. You are brought into a new community in Christ. We are joined together by what Christ has done for us. Do you feel alone? Do you feel hurt? Do you feel empty? You have brothers and sisters in this place. And then lastly, 
This meal signifies to us our expectancy in Christ. Look at what the Lord's Supper is pointing to. I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The Lord's Supper points not only to his death, but to something that is coming. Jesus is saying, I am so committed to bringing you into my eternal kingdom that I am willing to die for it. I am willing to go through the greatest injustice. I am willing to shed my blood to bring you into that kingdom so you can be with me forever. That's an oath he is taking with his life, friends. This meal, this Lord's Supper, as we eat of it together today, is meant to bring hope to us. That someday we're all going to gather around the feast, the table of God, in his presence, where all sin has been atoned for, has been done away with. And we'll be there with Jesus with so many more have gone before us and we get to celebrate forever with our God, our King. Man, do you feel weighed down by sin? Do you feel weighed down by the struggles and pains that you're going through in your life right now? Do you just feel like it's too much for you? I long for you to be able to eat this together with us and be reminded of the hope that is coming to you in Christ Jesus. See, the whole point of this meal is to work these truths into your heart until it changes you, friends. To keep working it in and working it in and working it in. Now, by way of conclusion, I I have to be honest with you, I've tricked you. I've tricked you a little bit. I've structured this sermon around who we are, what we need and how it changes us. But in reality, friends, this meal shows us something greater than ourselves. It shows us something greater than just us, just me. It really is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. As Christians, we proclaim not a ritual, not an event or a day, but rather we proclaim Christ and Him crucified. See, a Christian, if I can sum it up very simply, a Christian is someone who lives by this motto. What Jesus Christ has done for me is everything. It's everything to me. It changes the way I look at my life, the way I look at other people. It changes the way I handle my finances, my family. It changes the way I, I, I structure my life. What Jesus Christ has done for me is everything. Do you see what the key is? The key here is worship, friends. We are changed by worshiping our God, by giving worth and glory to him, to ascribe worth to Jesus. So in a couple of minutes, when we eat of this table together, we eat of this juice and this cracker, it's not that that saves you. But let it be a reminder to you of the one who has saved you, who has given every last drop of himself for you. That's what changes us. He is the sacrificial lamb. Let's do this in remembrance with great joy. I'm going to pray, and uh, just as the worship team comes, we're going to um, just remember his death on the cross by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the elements will be passed out. And I'm going to ask if if just as you are handed these, that you search your heart, that you examine yourself. And I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, if it's just like over your head, I really encourage you to come talk to us. And, and maybe today you, you don't know Jesus and maybe you're just like, man, I want that. I want to know what it's like to, to have my life changed by him, by making it more about him and not about me. Can I just, can I, can I just encourage you to pray, to ask God, just, just invite him to be here with you right now. Because I truly believe that by faith, 
if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is, is the Savior, he's died on the cross for your sins, he was risen again for your justification, if you believe that, you are saved, friends. You have new life in Christ. We're gonna pray, and then we invite you to come to this table with great joy. It will be handed out. We're gonna have some people come forward. I'm just gonna invite them to do that now, and we'll, I'm gonna pray, and then we will read 1 Corinthians 11, and, and then we will continue to worship and celebrate God by singing about the wonderful cross. Why don't we pray this morning as we close. Lord Jesus, we love you because you have given every little bit of yourself. You are the true Passover lamb. Every other lamb pointed, pointed to the great lamb of God. God, you were, we often think, God, for all the injustices in this world, for all of the pain and struggle we walk through in our lives. There is a great injustice, but yet there's a great joy in the fact that God himself would shed his own blood for us. Oh, how wonderful it is, God. How wonderful it is. Father, I pray that now as we celebrate this Lord's Supper, we would survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain, I count as loss. I count it as loss. Oh God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. To you alone we ascribe the worth of this. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, I want to read just as we begin and as we sing this song, just quickly, I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Paul is saying this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, eat and drink in the dependency that is in Christ and Christ alone, in the community that is in Christ and Christ alone, and in the hope and expectancy that comes from Christ and Christ alone. Let us worship, let's stand as we sing and close off with our worship together.